Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Renegade, the Mercenary Series Book One by Raven White, and this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter One, Eliza. My head hurts. I'm sure I've been hit by a truck. It's the only reason I'd be in this amount of pain. I hear a regular blip and my, open my eyes. Bright sunlight hits my eyes and I moan. Someone catches my hand then, squeezing it tight. Thank God you're back. I know that voice. It's my brother. He's worried, but why? What's happened? I try to say his name, but I can't form my words, and his name comes out garbled. What the fuck? I've got a tube down my throat, and it's preventing me from speaking. Where am I? I try to focus my eyes, but everything is blurry, and I start to panic as I try to pull the tube out. Ron grabs my hand to stop me, and I shake my head, begging him with my eyes to help me. I want it out, now. My panic increases as I fight against his hold on my hand. Help! She's panicking! She's trying to remove the tube! Ron calls. I struggle against his grip. I want it out! Eliza, stop! We'll get it out, but you just need to relax! I want to talk, but I can't. A groan is the best I can do. My eyes focus on my brother until his face becomes clearer, and I can see he's worried by the look in his eyes. The doctor has arrived and leans over me, forcing my attention onto him. Okay, Eliza, I know you want the tube out, but you need to relax for me, okay? If you don't, I'll have to sedate you and it will have to stay in. Once we get this out, I can give her something to help her relax. Little sis, I'm here. Nothing will happen to you again. Don't worry. Just relax. I'll take care of everything. Ron whispers. His hand is still holding mine and he gives it a gentle squeeze. I look into his eyes and force myself to calm, knowing he would die before he let anything hurt me. Once the doctor removes the tube, I feel cold liquid in my arm as he injects me with something. Everything fades away as my eyes close and I'm lost in darkness once more. When I wake again, I've lost track of time. I open and close my mouth and there's no obstruction there. Was it all just a dream? I can still hear the blipping sound. It's the same constant rhythm as before, but the sun is no longer shining, and the only light in the room comes from the ceiling. My eyes don't hurt like last time, which makes me think it was just a dream. Hey, sis, are you back with us? My brother asks. I focus on him beside the bed, and I try to talk again, but my throat is sore. Water. He gets a glass with a straw. Just a few sips, slowly. Your throat will hurt a little. The liquid burns in my throat, but I can keep drinking. I'm so thirsty. Thanks, I managed to say. You're out of danger. The rest will mend with time. He's relieved. I can hear it in his voice. Do you remember what happened? No. The last thing I remember is finishing the concert and heading to my car. I respond. I I joined a band a couple of weeks ago as their lead singer, and we're currently on tour around Canada. That's right, but before you got there, someone assaulted you. The doctor says you're lucky they were able to relieve the swelling on your brain. I'm shocked. Who would do this to me? I haven't received any threats since joining the band. Why? Ron sighs. Knowing him, he thinks he's failed at protecting me, even though he wasn't with me. We don't know yet. I'm working the case on the side. I can't be directly involved because of my relationship with you. I can't be impartial. One of our best agents is working on it. That's what's bugging him. He wants to participate, but can't. It's not your fault. I'm not the first person to be assaulted. I'm right about that. And a few have lost their lives in the process. I'm trying hard not to think about that, though. Maybe, but they're not my sister. Yep. That's my brother, an alpha protector to the core. You can't follow me around 24 seven. You've got your own life to live. And then there's your job. He walks to the window. I would if I could. It's too much. I know he feels guilty, but he needs to stop blaming himself. Ron, I'm not a little girl anymore. You can't be with me all the time. 
He turns around and I see his eyes are watering. For the first fucking time in my life, I was scared. You could have died. I don't want to lose you as well. I couldn't live with myself if it happened. That declaration stuns me. My brother has never let his emotions get the better of him, even when our parents were killed in a car crash a few years ago. I'm here and I'm fine. He sighs and moves closer to my bed. Yeah, you're right, but we need you off the radar for a couple of weeks until we know who attacked you. I know what he means. He wants me to hide and stay home where he thinks I'll be safe. I'm not hiding, Ron. I'll go crazy stuck at home on my own. You know that's not me. I've never been like that. I've also got a contract. I need to be on stage with the band. I can't leave them in the lurch and hide. He sighs again. I knew he would give in. At least I think he is. I knew you would say that. I know your career is important to you, but bear with me. I need you safe. We can't give whoever it is another chance to hurt you. You still have at least a week in hospital to make sure you're okay. I've talked to your manager. He's not happy, but he understands. What are they going to do in the meantime? He takes my hand. I, I don't know. Once you're released, you and your manager can talk about what happens going forward. But your safety comes first. They've sorted something out and they already have a plan in place from what Frank said. This isn't your fault, Eliza. You need to remember that. I had won a contest to be part of a band and the tour was supposed to be our big debut. I know, but I feel like I'm letting everyone down. Your fans want you back. You've received a lot of flowers and cards since the assault. I wonder then how long I was unconscious. How long was I out? Two and a half weeks. That long? I'm shocked. I've been out for almost three weeks. We had four concerts a week scheduled. The tickets would have had to be refunded or the shows rescheduled. No wonder the band is making plans to go on without me. They can't be off the road for that long. I know, some of the band members have been in to see you. Your agent hasn't been here, but he's called. We'll work it out, sis. Try not to worry, okay? What's next, big brother? I'm lost and I want to cry myself to oblivion. My life is suddenly a mess and my dream would be over before it really began. Right now, you need to concentrate on getting better. And I know people that can help. I know you're scared and in pain, but I promise it will be better soon. I let him comfort me, but I'm scared. Renegade. I look at Hacker. Have you figured out where she is yet? Maybe. I'm not sure. I'm getting there, though. I'm currently on what is supposed to be an easy assignment. Our former teammate and friend Dean, or Ice as he's more commonly known, asked Hacker and me to help a couple of his lawyer friends to locate Susie, the woman they are in a relationship with. Right now, we're in a hotel room checking the information we have so far, which isn't a lot. I'm pretty sure she goes to that cafe each Thursday morning. I've seen the CCTV for the last couple of weeks and she's there every Thursday. Have a look and tell me if you think it's her. I look at the footage and agree it's Susie, which confirms what Jonathan told us about her personality and the fact she likes order and routine. Tomorrow is Thursday, so it's the best opportunity to go to the cafe and follow her back to where she's staying. When did Jonathan and Simon arrive? I ask. Their plane lands in the morning, but one of us will have to go. She could bolt if she sees them. She doesn't know either of us, so she won't see us as a threat. We're just lucky we were able to get another room here for them. <laughs> yes, lucky is the word for it. We didn't know a big convention was happening in Ottawa, and most of the hotels are fully booked. Do you want to go to the cafe tomorrow? I ask. You go. I'll wait for Jonathan and Simon to arrive and monitor you from here. I'm better on the computer side of things. Okay, what time does she usually get there? Around 7. She has breakfast there, Hacker tells me. Fine. Let's call it a night. There's not much else we can do now. It's late and I need to get there before she does so I'm less noticeable. Hacker nods and I go to the bathroom to wash up before jumping into bed and falling asleep quickly. My phone wakes me with the sound of the ringtone set for the members of our ex-military team, both past and present. When we left the military, we all joined the same company that specializes in off-the-book government work. Renegade, 
I answer, half asleep. Renegade Sparrow, I need your help. I sit up quickly and notice Hacker is awake as well. He looks at me in question, his eyebrows raised. Problem, Sparrow? I say, so Hacker knows who I'm talking to. Sparrow left the company to join his local police force not long before Ice left. Hacker had moved to sit on his bed in front of me as soon as he heard Sparrow's name and is now watching me closely. He knows Sparrow calling at this time of night means it's something serious. I need you to repay that favor you owe me. It's a matter of life and death. I'm fully awake all of a sudden. Are you in trouble, Sparrow? He sighs into the phone. Not me, my sister. Where are you? Ottawa. Hacker's with me. What's your mission? He asks, knowing if I'm with one of the team, then we're on assignment. Nothing major, just doing a favor for some of Isis's friends. Good, so your leaving won't be a problem. How soon can you be here? I look at Hacker. Can you book me a flight home? Hacker jumps from his bed and heads to his computer. I turn my attention back to Sparrow. Hacker is looking for a flight now. Is Ice still in love? Everyone knows about Ice's love life. He and his brother are in a relationship with Susie's best friend and are planning their wedding next month. It's one of the reasons Ice asked for our help in tracking her down. His woman wants Susie at their wedding. Yeah, you'll probably get a wedding invitation soon. Sparrow starts to laugh. I hope he's got my new address. I smile. He's got Hacker. Yeah, that son of a bitch. Still loves his computer more than women? Sparrow asks me. I chuckle at his question. Everyone knows Hacker and his love for his computer. Hacker heads back to me and hands me a piece of paper. I've booked you a ticket for 10 tomorrow morning. That will still give you time to follow Susie. Sparrow, Hacker's booked me a ticket. I should be there around noon. I tell him. Good. Meet me at the University of Montreal's health center. What's going on? Why there? He isn't part of the team, but we've done a lot together. As I said, it's my sister. It's too complicated to go over the phone. I'll explain everything when you get here. See you tomorrow. Text me when you arrive. I'll see you tomorrow. I hang up and look at Hacker. What's up with him? Hacker asks. Not him, his sister. What do you think happened? I sigh and put my phone back on the nightstand. No idea, but I'm guessing it's bad. He wants me to meet him at the hospital. <sighs> Shit, that's not good. I'll finish up here. You've got to help Sparrow. This is an easy mission anyway. I nod at Hacker and we try to sleep again. I look at the clock. It's almost four in the morning. I'm used to a lack of sleep, but I'm looking forward to having breakfast and a big coffee to help keep me awake for the rest of the day. I'm at the cafe 15 minutes before Susie's usual time. I make sure to sit close to the cashier so I can listen to anything they discuss. The waitress takes my order and at the same time I ask her for the bill. I'll pay right away so if I have to leave fast it won't cause a problem. She comes back with my meal and I give her the money. I look at my watch. It's seven. Susie, Susie should be here any minute. The door opens and I look up. She's here right on time. Susie, the usual? The waitress asks her. She nods and sits at a table close to mine. I can continue to eat as I watch her as she plays with her phone until her plate of eggs, bacon, and toast arrive. I finish before she does and the waitress asks if I want more coffee. I nod at her as it will give me an excuse to hang around a, little, a while longer and I could use the extra shot of caffeine. A few minutes later, Susie stands and heads toward the cashier. I wait for her to go through the door, leave a generous tip for the waitress, and follow her. A few blocks away, she enters an apartment complex. So this is where she's hiding. I enter the elevator just as the doors start to close and check which floor she's pushed the button for. What floor? She asks me. I smile at her. Ah, the same floor, same as you, yours. She's on the 10th floor. I let her exit first and head in the opposite direction and then double back so she thinks I've made a mistake. I pass her as she's putting the key in the lock and notice the number on the ap door. Apartment 1010. I continue to walk past her as she heads inside. She didn't suspect a thing. I pull out my phone, dial Hacker, and give him the name of the apartment building. She went into apartment 1010. See if you can find out who owns it. Roger that. Are you coming back? I look at my watch. My plane le leaves in two hours. I don't have time. Roger that. <sighs> 
Negative. I'll head to the airport. Can you pack my gear and send it home for me? Will do. Thanks. Is the chief sending someone to replace me? He sighs. Yeah, Sensei is coming later today. I laugh. You'll be busy keeping him on a leash. Good thing the surveillance was this morning. Hacker chuckles. That man is supposed to be a ninja, but he's got no idea how to be subtle. I laugh hard. Keep me posted. I'm heading home. Copy that. Call if you need anything, he tells me. Will do. See you soon. I hail a taxi. To the airport. The driver nods and the car starts to move. I wonder what has happened to Sparrow's sister. I've never met her, but have seen a couple of pictures that Sparrow had with him while we were deployed. All I remember is that she's young. Traffic in Ottawa is worse than Montreal, but I still board the plane on time. Almost two hours later, we're landing in Montreal at the Pierre Elliott Trudeau International Airport. I grab my truck from long-term parking and head to the University of Montreal Health Center. I text Sparrow asking for the room number. He messages back that visiting hours are over till later this afternoon and he says he'll wait for me at the main entrance. Then we can go for a coffee and he can fill me in on what happened.